air traffic control versus pilots. Your right main is now missing from the airplane. It is, it's fallen off the airplane. Say your intentions. Coming up. Hey, 7-4 crew, welcome back. If you don't know me, my name's Kelsey. I'm a 747 pilot. My channel, 7-4 Gear, is all about aviation. Now, this video is very interesting because what you have is a new pilot. This girl is probably has about 30 hours. She's working on her very first license. And based off of the circumstances of the video, I'm gonna guess she's probably been in the plane two, maybe three times all by herself. So with those circumstances, you can imagine how uncomfortable you would be when something goes terribly wrong. I'm not as uncomfortable as Stella is right here, but to this day, I still don't like flying by myself. I just get bored. All right, let's get into it. Warrior 2496 X-ray, runway nine, full length, cleared for takeoff. Cleared for takeoff, and X-ray. Uh, tower, uh, that warrior just a part of the right main gear strut and wheel just fell off the airplane. Roger. Warrior 2496 X-ray tower. Yeah. Okay, Warrior 2496 X-ray, the uh, Waco just said that your right main is now missing from the airplane. It is, it's fallen off the airplane. Say your intentions. Can I circle back to land? Warrior 906 X-ray affirmative. Um, are you a solo, ma'am? I'm a student pilot solo, yeah. Okay, just, it's, it'll be okay. Just, um, Go ahead and uh, circle the airport for now. Make a right turn to circle. We're going to get some people out to help you, okay? okay. So just say a pattern altitude, 1,100, and you can make a right turn out, okay? Okay. This girl is obviously rattled, and I would be too, considering the amount of flight experience that she has. Something I got told when I started flight school from my very first flight instructor was, when you start flight school, you get two bags. One bag is full of luck, and one bag is empty, and it's your experience bag. As you go through flight school, you're going to do some dumb things. You're going to make a lot of different mistakes. And each of those mistakes and dumb things that you do, you're taking something out of your luck bag. So as you gain experience, you're going to be putting more and more chips into your experience bag. Because sooner or later, your luck's going to run out and you're going to need to rely on your experience. This girl has maybe 20, 30 hours and she's already out of the luck chips. But this controller did something I really liked. Pattern altitude 1100 and you can make a right turn out, okay? Now this controller realizes that this girl is a student pilot and realizes just how flustered she's going to be. So what she does is instead of saying turn southbound pattern altitude, which she could have technically said, she said make a right hand turn out and fly at 1100 feet, which is the pattern altitude. Now pattern altitude, the simple way to explain this is when you're going through flight school and you're doing takeoffs and landings, you're flying in what's called a racetrack pattern. You're taking off, turning right, turning right, turning right, landing, or turning left, either way. But that altitude you are going to maintain is usually, on this type of plane, about a thousand feet above the airport. What that does is it eliminates the amount of thought that this pilot has to have. They go, okay, cool, turn to the right, 1,100 feet. That's easier than turn south, pattern altitude because your brain's starting to get overloaded when things get complicated you can start to get tunnel vision so the controller alleviated that because obviously the controller is going to have a lot more experience in this situation than this pilot who's new and maybe has 20 or 30 hours in the plane now this is something that i actually do when i'm briefing when we're going out of an airport that has mountains or buildings or something that's dangerous in a certain sector so let's say you have mountains to the south Instead of saying, hey, on this departure, we got mountains to the south, what I say is, hey, on this departure, we do not want to turn to the right. And the reason I say right is because that's easier to be oriented knowing right and left than south, is because on the airport, you could be spinning around a bunch of different ways. So I say, I, we don't want to turn right on this departure. So that way, if a controller messes something up and they say, turn right, we're all thinking, we don't want to go that direction. Now listen to the swap over in the way the controller is talking from controller to nurturer mode. Warrior 906 X-ray affirmative. Um, are you a solo, ma'am? I'm a student pilot solo, yeah. Okay, just it's, it'll be okay. Just um, go ahead and uh, circle the airport for now. Make a right turn to circle. We're going to get some people out to help you, okay? okay? I'm not sure if this controller is a mom, but the amount of nurture that she gives to this pilot was perfect. Instead of just going hard controller mode, she gave him a balance of the controller side, which is, hey, 
this is what I need you to do, be safe, but you can hear that change in that pitch in her voice, which is like, everything's gonna be okay. And I think that's really important here to note. This controller is being very professional while keeping this pilot calm. Now that's not her job to keep the pilot calm, but she just automatically went into that mode of, hey, let's keep this pilot calm and let's help them the most that we can. And one of the things that the pilot needs the most help with in this specific situation is to calm down. Obviously, with a little bit of experience, having your wheel come off your plane, that's gonna make you really nervous. And the pilots always say that controllers are there to help the pilots out. And really, what this pilot needed at this exact moment was to be more calm and be more comfortable. So I think the controller is doing an excellent job here. Let's see what happens next. Maggie, this is John. How you doing? I'm okay. Okay, you're doing a great job flying the airplane. Uh, keep doing what you're doing. They're uh, going to stage the equipment uh, just in case anything is needed there, but we're just going to wait. We're going to take our time here. We got plenty of time. You got plenty of fuel. We got plenty of daylight. So um, just try to relax. And you always heard me say go back to basics. So we're going to work the basics here as much as possible, okay? All right. We're going to do this just like we did. I know it's hard to say this, but treat it like as much as like a normal landing as you can. Um, so the power settings we've always done, the pitch for the airspeed, keep everything as normal as you can. All right. So you got Maggie, who's the pilot, and then you have this guy who's talking on the radio now is actually her flight instructor, which is about as good as it's going to get when you have an in-flight emergency. You want the guy that you have been comfortable with and has been teaching you everything. You want that familiar voice. So really, it worked out great that he was nearby enough to get over there and to get into the control tower. He said something here that you may not be familiar with, which was staging the equipment. Listen here. They're uh, going to stage the equipment. Anytime a pilot declares an emergency, which she didn't, but they did it for her because they realized the situation. Anytime a pilot declares an emergency, they're going to roll the fire trucks out and they're going to get the fire trucks out. Now he's saying they're going to get the equipment ready and staged just in case they need anything. Uh, that is kind of a soft way of putting, we're going to put the fire trucks out there in case there's a real problem. We're able to put the plane or put the fire out or, or get you out or whatever is needed. So that's what he's saying. That's kind of a, a nice way of saying it. Listen to what the instructor says right here. You always heard me say, go back to basics. So we're going to work the basics here as much as possible, okay? When you do your final exam on the 747, one of the things that you have to do is fly a two engine approach. So you fly with two engines working and two engines not working. It would be great if it was one engine on each side that was not working, but that's not how it works. It's two engines working and two engines not working. And the thing that one of the instructors said to me is, when the first time I was practicing this was, hey, realize it's, you're gonna go back to basics, all the normal stuff, normal, 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 which is basically what this instructor is telling to this student pilot. Remember, this is still an airplane, it's still flying, all the normal things that apply. Obviously, in the case of having two engines working and two engines not working, it's not exactly the normal situation, but the plane is still working under the exact same principles. So don't get overloaded with the fact like, oh my gosh, we're, we're leaned out this way, or this or this or this is happening. Go back to the basics. If you remember, I've talked about that old Vietnam era B-52 pilot that I used to fly with PJ. PJ used to say the exact same thing. I was so fortunate to fly with him early in my career and we did a lot of flights together and he taught me a lot of different things. But one of the things that he always used to say is, realize as long as the rubber touches before the metal, you're gonna be okay. And that's basically like, just keep the plane flying. If it's windy or whatever the situation is, realize it's gonna do and react the exact same way every different type of plane. Now he flew a lot of different planes. That was maybe the uh, third or fourth different type of total plane that I fly, flew. It was only the second commercial plane that I was flying, but he was really mentoring me without me knowing it and is teaching me like, hey, realize at the end of the day, it's going back to basics. And that's what this instructor is telling her. Listen how she calms down from here All right. and compare it to how she was talking at the start of this video when she realized she had a problem. I'm a student pilot solo, yeah. She is getting more comfortable, which is really important. Something that you may have heard or that's an old saying in aviation is, if you have an emergency, wind your watch. And what that means is it's an old thing that used to be in the day is that when watches need to be wound, but is that if you have an emergency, don't make a harsh, quick reaction, especially in this case for her. She's flying, the airplane is flying fine. It doesn't care that the landing gear is missing. That's not really important to that plane. So in an emergency, wind your watch. Now that's one of the great things about flying a fixed wing aircraft is you have time typically to work out and think about your problem. 
That does not apply in helicopters. If you have a problem in your helicopter, you need to react right away. But on a fixed wing aircraft, wind your watch. Take a second, process everything. Sometimes you can make a situation worse by reacting or doing something silly and reacting too quickly. So she's doing the right thing and she's starting to calm herself down. She's realizing the plane is flying okay. She has a voice that she's familiar with. And so she's doing really well here. Greg and I have looked at the airplane through binoculars, so it's your right wheel that's missing. So as you end, the plus side here is you get a little bit of a left crosswind. So if you use your normal left wing crosswind correction, that means the left side will touch down first, and you're just going to ease the right side down. It's going to try to pull to the right, so be prepared to use left, as much left rudder and left brake as you have to to try to keep it on the center line. All right. This has to be the most flight instructor thing I've ever heard in my life. So be prepared to use left, as much left rudder and left brake as you have to to try to keep it on the center line. When I had her level of experience, I was just happy that I was making it on the runway each time. But as a typical flight instructor, they're always trying to get you to keep your wheel running down the middle on the center line. So that's one thing you will always hear in flight school. It's something that they will yell at you or say to you all the time. You'll probably hear it a couple thousand times as you practice your landings at different stages as center line, center line, center line, because a lot of times pilots will land to the left or land to the right, and you want to maintain that center line and always keep your nose going right down the middle of the runway. That's very important to learn early on because as your jet gets bigger and bigger, or as your plane gets bigger and bigger, or as your runway gets more and more narrow, you need to be able to keep that nose running right down the middle so that way you know you're not going to have a problem. This is a picture of what the instructors are looking at when they're looking at Maggie's plane. You can see right here, this tire is missing from the main landing gear. Something the instructor could have told Maggie here also would have been land on the left side of the runway. He knows the plane is going to pull to the right. We all know that it's going to pull to the right. By telling her to land on the left side of the runway, it would have increased her chances of staying on the runway the entire time. But on these smaller planes, it's not a big deal. If you have an excursion and go off of a runway on a small plane like this, it's going to damage the plane and you're probably going to be okay. The plane might need some repairs, but just realize it's not a huge deal. And at her level of experience, if you had said, okay, we want you to land the left side of the runway over here with the tire missing, I don't know, maybe I could have done it because for some reason when I went through flight school, I was always landing on one side or the other of the center line. I can't remember if it was the right side or the left side, but I always landing on one side of the center line. And my instructor said, you perfectly land this far away from the center line every time. Can you just slide this thing over six or seven feet? I don't know why, but I kept always landing to the left or the right. But if he had said, hey, try landing a little bit to the left side of the runway, it would have increased her chances of staying on the runway there. But like I said, on a small plane like this, it's not a big deal if you slide off. It's like being in a small car crash. You may have seen some clips like this of planes landing totally off the runway and still being able to make it on without there being any issue. Now, if you drop a 747 30 feet out of the sky and land totally not on the runway, it's definitely not going to work out that well. But on a small plane like this, it's going to be all right. Let's see what Maggie does next. Looks real good, Maggie. Uh, you get enough spacing out there? Um, I think so, yeah. We're not going to rush everything. This is going to be perfectly normal. If if something looks wrong, I'll tell you to do a go around, but we're going to do a perfectly normal landing here. All right. Um, should I drop the flaps now? So, Maggie, when you're comfortable, go to full flaps. All right. I'm there now. Sorry. That's okay. You're doing a great job. Just remember that zero nine your aiming point. Very light winds, Maggie. Very uh, light left crosswind. So that's, that's all to your advantage. You're doing great. Keep doing what you're doing. I'm going to go back all the way on the tower. You're doing a perfect job, Maggie. Just treat it like a normal landing. It's going to try to pull to the right. So when that when that, that left main touches down, our uh, right main touches down. You may have noticed that he said zero 09 is your aiming point. Listen here. Just remember that zero 09 is your aiming point. What he's referring to is the numbers at the very start of the runway. I talked about that in the video with uh, Leonardo DiCaprio, Catch Me If You Can. But basically what he's referring to is those numbers at the very start of the runway. Now he's saying those are your aiming point. That doesn't necessarily mean it's your landing point, but those are the aiming point. And that's something that I got told in flight school. I don't, doesn't really work for me, but everybody's different. That aiming point is what the, the instructor is telling her 
to go aim at so that way she can land at the very start of the runway, which is important. But you never want to land, and this is my own personal opinion, you don't want to land on those numbers at the very start of the runway. Because if you come in too short or you lose power, you could actually land short of the runway. And there's no reason to take a bad situation and make it worse. So just keep in mind, aiming point, landing point, not the same thing. But I do like what the instructor says here. It's going to try to pull to the right, so when that, when that left main touches down, uh, right main touches down. Something that I do when I'm doing a briefing and there's something broken on the aircraft that's going to be abnormal or affect our landing is that I will say, hey, before landing, maybe mention this thing to me that's broken. For example, let's say you have a thrust reverser that is not working. So if you use your thrust reversers, you're going to get a lot of pull on one side and none on the other. So you'll say, hey, don't use your thrust reversers. And that's something you might want to say right at the very beginning or right as you're getting ready to land because that way you don't have a problem. It's just a little reminder. So Maggie obviously knows that her wheel is missing, but as she's getting ready to land, the instructor is reminding her like, hey, just remember, this thing is going to pull to the right. Just as a little reminder to put that right at the top of your memory because she's got a lot of things that she's dealing with right now. So I thought it was really smart that he did that. Next, listen to what Maggie says here about her power. I'm gonna go back all the way off the power. She's talking to herself and she's talking out loud and she's talking to her instructor and she's obviously uncertain. And something to know, Maggie, if you ever watch this video, I did the same thing when I worked on some of my initial solo flights. I would talk to myself. Okay, I'm gonna talk. I didn't talk to the controller. I didn't have a problem like you did, but I would talk to myself. Okay, I'm gonna do flaps one here. And that's just because you're talking out loud and just kind of like reassuring that you're doing the right thing, really. As you gain more experience, you can be a little bit more wild because you understand the aerodynamics of a plane a lot more. So something that she's doing is talking to herself. She's a little bit unsure. She put her flaps out all the way early, which is fine. She's talking about pulling the power out, but she's really actually doing a really good job with the circumstances. She's making the corrections that she needs to do to get the plane safely onto the runway. There's no problem with putting your flaps out really early. There's, I mean, you're just gonna be using more power to get to the runway, but that's fine, especially in a situation like this. It's better to be configured and have everything situated and that's just one less thing that you need to do last minute. So she is nervous, she is uncertain about what she's doing, but I honestly would be totally uncertain as well with the level of flight experience that she has at this point. I'm a student pilot solo, yeah. And asking about flaps or power is something that you'll see as well. If you ever go to the airlines, you'll see it with new pilots when they're going from, let's say, a small propeller plane to their very first jet. They're, they're uncertain about, hey, do I put the flaps out now or do I do the power out now? They don't know. And so they're asking the captain, the Czech airman that they're flying with, what they should be doing. And they're basically walking them through like, hey, now you want to do this. Now you want to do this. Maggie doesn't have that uh, comfort of having somebody there with her. So th this is part of what's going on. You'll see airline pilots do the exact same thing as they go through their career. And as they get more and more experience with jets or different jets, they'll get more and more confident of like, okay, cool, now I think I should do this, now I'm gonna do that. And they'll start making their decisions for themselves. But early on, even with a guy with 1,000 or 1,500 hours, when they're getting into their very first jet, They'll be asking those types of questions. Flaps out now? I think I'm gonna pull the power out now. Those are some things that you will hear when you start going to the airline. So it's not just the fact that she's got 30 or so hours. It's just that she's uncomfortable and unsure about the plane, which is how most people would react in this circumstance. Let's hear how Maggie lands it. Beautiful job, Maggie. You get a whole bunch of people clapping for you up here. She obviously gets the plane on the ground okay and was willing to sit in there and reply to her instructor that she was happy if everything went well. This is what the plane looked like after she landed. Obviously it's a little banged up, but that is not important at all. What's most important is that she's okay. This is a great example of using all available resources. And so you have the pilot using air traffic control, and the controller's helping them out, the instructor's helping them out, and she's using all available resources. Now, it's mostly them giving them to her and not her asking for them, but it doesn't really matter. This is an example, a great example of aviation teamwork. In an emergency, you have so many people that are there that are willing to do anything that they can to help you. I read online that the instructor heard that there was a problem, was in this plane with another person, ran back, took the plane back, parked, got out, got a 
I don't know, something to get over to the control tower and got in the control tower to help Maggie out. But that just shows you in aviation just how much of a family it is. It, even though sometimes you'll hear pilots bickering with controllers and stuff like that on these air traffic control versus pilots, you'll know that at the end of the day, if you're in a jam, nobody's going to do more to help you out than that controller. And I've talked about that in some of the other videos. Now, if you want to see some pilots flying a 747 where they're missing their landing gear, check out this video here. And if you want to see some pilots who are not getting along with air traffic control nearly as well, check out this video up here. I look forward to hearing from you. Until then, keep the blue side up.